Welcome in to the New Orleans Pelicans podcast, the official podcast of your New Orleans Pelicans, a podcast dedicated to everything you need to know about the squad. Hear from players, coaches, broadcasters, and those who cover the NBA on a daily basis. It's time to flock up. The New Orleans Pelicans podcast starts right now. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the New Orleans Pelicans podcast. I'm Gus Kattengill, as always, joined alongside Mr. Jim Eichenhofer. Today, a special radio roundtable. So we got the voices that will carry you throughout the rest of the season. Mr. John DeShazer, analyst for the New Orleans Pelicans radio network and the voice of the Pels, Todd Graffanini. Gentlemen, first off, thank y'all for stopping by this morning. Y'all, It's game week, by the way, like regular season game week. Y'all excited? I'm pretty fired up. I mean, I, I don't know about JD. It's 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 time to go. You know, I, I wish I wish camp and preseason might have been a little longer. Some people might disagree with that. Uh, I, I just you know with the with the new turnover in the roster and the lineup changes and everything, I just would have liked to have seen a little bit more. But hey, that's uh, that's the way it is. First game is on Wednesday, and 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 here we go. It's go time. Um, I'm good with the preseason being the length that it is because. This team has a propensity to get injured, Trey Murphy. And so I'm pretty good with it being short. And and I've done an, an NBA preseason when it was eight games, and we did all eight games on the radio, and it was like, you know what? After about three, it was like, you know what? Whew. Now, we see, I didn't even bring this. up the I word, J.D. I mean, if you wanted to go there. <laughs> I, there. I, I mean, he can't help it. I mean, he's it, wearing look, a Saints shirt right now. right like it. there, it's oh, there. It's a real shame. Yeah, it's there. <laughs> all right. Yeah, yeah, I remember, I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> I remember three and four game preseason road trips. Let's never go back there. That that was absolutely never, brutal. Never. I mean, they were supposed to have a three game road trip this year too, but that was um, part of just a four game preseason. So, yeah, I think I would have been okay with the same time frame for preseason, but more games, less practices. Is that something that I think we can agree on? We don't. It was a lot of practice days. It was uh, at a certain point. It's like okay, we're ready to compete and play some games. Hmm. Be interesting to kind of see as we get going on here. So we're going to delve into a couple of Pelicans topics here as well. We'll also take a look at the rest of the league going into it. Because, guys, that's one of the things that I felt we talked a lot about on podcasts last year or on the broadcast. I just think the NBA is so competitive right now. The East has gotten better, right? I mean, look, you talked about it earlier this preseason when the Pels played Orlando. That that was a team that was young. They got into the postseason seeing that. So you're seeing a lot of youth teams doing that there was a three-way tie for first place in the western conference going into the final game of the year so i i think the season is gonna continue that huh guys like this like the nba right now is in an incredible place uh, it's in a i i mean look jd's been doing this a lot longer than i have i i just i don't recall the nba being this competitive i mean you, even if you think about the quote-unquote bottom teams in the league they can still step up and beat you uh, uh, on any given night, so it, it's it's going to be truly fascinating to watch night after night, uh, all around the league. All the games are going to be important because the margin of error is so small when you're talking about the final seedings after game 82. Yeah, there's usually an imbalance. Either the East is better than the West, or the West is better than the East, and then it's cyclical. You know, it kind of goes around. You you know, it just happens. But this is really a, probably about as balanced as the NBA has been. I'm sure if Pete Rozelle were alive, he would love this because there is parity through this league. Uh, very few teams that you look at that you'll say, you know what, right now, today, they'll be in the lottery. Very few teams you look at that way. And you're looking around the league and saying, not only can anybody beat anybody on any given night, but you guys just mentioned Orlando. Orlando was like an antidote for the Pelicans last year. That was a team that had the kind of roster and the kind of athletes and the kind of overall everything that gave the Pelicans problems. And then we saw it again with Oklahoma City in the playoffs. So this is the way this league is right now. I mean, people aren't picking Dallas to go back to the finals, and Dallas just went to the finals. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's that kind of, you know, and, and it's great. It's great because now, you know, there aren't those random Tuesdays that you're looking at a game on TV and you're like, ah, this isn't going to be very competitive. You're looking at almost all of them saying, you know what, you don't have time to start slow. You don't have time to catch up. You got to be ready to go out of the gate because the hole you fall into might be a hole you can't climb out of. I think there's 13 teams in the West that have playoff aspirations, and there definitely aren't 13 teams in the East, 
But I mean, if you if you go back even maybe a year or two in the East, when there was three or four teams that were a top tier, there's teams like JD mentioned Orlando, Indiana, Cleveland. That second group of teams is so much stronger, I think, than it has been in recent years. So you have a West that has almost everyone thinking we can make the postseason, and you have an East where there's probably twice as many teams that are super competitive compared to what it was not that long ago. Yeah, and we'll start talking about maybe some teams to keep an eye on. It'd be exciting. Look, I know preseason's preseason, but Dame Lillard said he didn't have that kind of offseason he would have liked. They look really good, him and Giannis together as a duo. So that might be a different team. What the Knicks did last year, can they replicate it? We'll, we'll see on that. But let's focus on the Pels. That's what this is, by the way. Um, so, Jim, we'll start with you. Who do you think will improve the most? Amongst Pell players. Yeah, I think I think one of the easier answers might be Jordan Hawkins based on the way that he's played so far in preseason. But, I mean, I think Eve Misi has a chance. I'm going to go with him just because I, I'm going to go with this category as most improved as from the beginning of the season until the end of the season. I'm going to say he's my most improved player prediction just based on, I mean, I feel like from October 1st to October 21st, what we've already seen from him in some of the games. And if you listen to some of the projections after the draft, by no means am I a draft expert, but based on what other people said, you thought maybe he's a long-term project, that he's somebody who isn't going to contribute a ton but this season. But based on how he's he looked in preseason, it's like you, you think he's going to be on the floor right away. So I'm going to go with him. Hmm. That's really good choices, really good choices. I'm going to go to the opposite end of the spectrum because, because in this – might not make a lot of sense to people, but I think it might be DJ DJ Murray. And the reason I, I think that is because I believe his efficiency is going to increase. I think he's playing with better players, and I think that's going to help his all-around game. Now, he is a fantastic player already, but I think maybe – so if his, if his scoring goes down but his assists go up, if he's – you know, the the better defender that we know he can be, the kind of defender that we know he can be, and he's out there with, with Herb Jones. I mean, I just think his efficiency is going to, to increase. I think his shooting percentage will probably go up because he'll be taking, he should theoretically, be taking better shots because he's playing with a team that should be able to get him better looks than the than the teams he's previously played with. And that includes Atlanta because, you know, Trey Young was taking all the shots. But be that <laughs> that's neither here nor there. I, I just think his efficiency is going to go up, and and like I said, I, I don't know. I don't think that's going to be a ten point increase, but that might be a two or three assist increase. That might be a half of a steal per game increase. Uh, it might be two or three percentage points on his you know twos and two or three percentage points on his threes. I just think it's going to increase. And look, uh, and I'm not going to agree with your uh, choice. Uh, that's a different question altogether, but I, I do agree that he has the opportunity to increase his totals, especially assist-wise. I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that he could be top three in assists this year because he's going to have a lot of opportunities with, with weapons either out on the wing or the pick and rolls with Zion or, or what have you. Um, it, he is going to be a complete player, and that's why he is here. But... As usual, Jim did it again because uh, I'm going to have to agree with him. Uh, I was going to go with Jordan Hawkins at first, but no, it is going to be Eve Misi. And this is just based on what I have watched in person since Nashville. And look, I didn't get a chance to see him in the summer league up close like you guys did just on TV. Right. Um, but what has impressed me about him is watching him when it's not – "Quote unquote practice time." He is really working uh, on his footwork, on his shot, on his rebounding. Um, he is he is going at it with Greg Monroe and Darnell Lazar, uh, a couple of player development coaches. They are they are working with the big men, and you can see Misi each and every day trying to get better. He wants to get better, and the thing now is just having watched the three preseason games. Look, guys, he's going to be in the rotation. He mm -hmm. is going to play. How many minutes, that remains to be seen. Uh, is he eventually going to be in the starting lineup? I think he is going to start some games at some point. But is he going to play 15 to 20 minutes? Is he going to play more than that? The only concern with him right now is foul trouble. He's got mm -hmm. to learn how to stay on the floor. 
uh, because he can give you the things that the Pelicans are going to need, specifically on the defensive end. We know he is a shot blocker. We've already seen it. Um, as far as his rotations coming from the from the weak side, and uh, it, he has got raw athletic ability, and that's been impressive. So from right now, preseason, game one on Wednesday to game 82, it's going to be easy. Yeah, you know, I think he's in a good situation, a really good situation, because there are things that he doesn't have to do that will remove correct. the pressure from mm-hmm. it. He, he ain't got to score. I mean, you know, so just play defense, yep. rebound, you know, defend and we'll figure out how to get you some lobs here and there. And we'll, as we do this, you can work on your offensive game. But he's in a really good situation for, for a guy in his his category. You know, Graf, you actually reminded me indirectly that he's also, to me, shown strides in Summer League. From what we saw there in person in Vegas, he's already – and obviously this is much better, more formidable competition of even in preseason of what he went, what he went up against compared to what he saw in Vegas where you're talking about more – similarly un- inexperienced guys that are just kind of starting their career. Well, like I said, he wants to get better. You can mm-hmm. tell. He is working on it every day. So that that's you got to have that mindset, yeah. and he's got it. All right. So I know later we're going to get to the hottest takes, but y'all guys got, y'all brought up really good players. Zion Williamson. To your point, you said DJ. DeJounte Murray, in what we've seen already just at practice in preseason – He's gonna have. He's not gonna have to take on five players. Yeah. A guy like DJ is gonna help him. So maybe his shooting percentage was fifty-seven percent last year. Might be a little bit better, right? Uh, points twenty-two, five rebounds. This team is putting an emphasis on getting rebounds. I think he's gonna get a few more rebounds this year because of the other guys that they have uh, to do as well. And one thing that we just saw in practice this past week. He is working on elbow jumpers. He's working on shooting the baseline jumper. He's working on shooting the basketball after practice, not just attacking the rim. So as crazy as it sounds, I I, I think he's going to be a better player because he has a true point guard playing with him. I think he's going to have a lot more shooting around him as well. His assist numbers can go up. So I think his numbers from last year are going to go up, and I think he's just going to be a better overall basketball player. I I, I really can't disagree with yeah. that. I'd, I'd like to see his rebounding numbers yeah. increase. Where, yeah. You know, he's capable, very capable, of averaging Ten a double-double. Game. Look, let's, let's see it With happen. that body and that athleticism, he should be close to a double double. Let's be real. He's 280, 270, 260 on a really, really great day. <laughs> but still, he's a big body. Mm-hmm. He's got great athleticism, great bounce. And you would you would love to see him uh, be more of a rebounder. And speaking of his jumper, we saw some of that come into play at toward right. the end of last season where he became a little bit more comfortable taking those shots. He adds that element to element to his game. And I, I think the maturity factor adds in for, for Z. He I think he got a good taste of what he can be last season when he was really in good shape, and he went through a dominant stretch where basically he could strap a team to his back and say, all right, guys, let's go. And it was like, whoa, this dude, at the at the point where he was injured last year, I thought, and maybe I'm exaggerating, but I thought he, I thought he was all NBA level. I thought he was probably one of the top 15 players in the league or so. And he was playing that way to me when he was carrying his team down the stretch. So there's no reason to believe he can't replicate that. And a play I can just reference in preseason in Miami. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, he's got top of the key. Bam Adebayo's five steps back. He's hard charging. Adebayo backs up to the restricted arc as he pulls up from the nail and, and drops it. Yeah, I mean, that's it. He that doesn't is, have to shoot 30 again. No, 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 no. But he just five the defense that's, honest that's exactly instead of right. – you know, forming the wall at the restricted arc and daring Z to go in and lay it in. Because um, that's, you know, that can be problematic with, yeah. with the bigger guys, especially out of bio. Yeah. And then when he, he starts making 10, 15 footers, then you've got to be honest on the defensive the side of the ball. The floodgates open. Exactly. Now, he makes that shot, the floodgates open. Because you is. have to guard him. you got to guard him. All right, guys, let's go to what do the Pels need to achieve to make it a successful season in your mind? J.D., start us off. Win the playoff series. I mean, it, this this cannot be – I don't – in my mind, I don't want to see this be a play-in team again. I don't want to see this be a first-round team again. I want to see this be a team that wins a first-round playoff series. To me, that is the next step – in the maturation, evolution, whatever you want to call it, 
of this franchise. You got to not just get there, but you got to put something on the wall that makes you say, okay, we're continuing to move forward. And so I don't want, I don't want to, I ain't, I, we weren't. I don't think any of us in this room were happy with playing last year, mm-hmm. <laughs> and you know certainly you, you weren't satisfied. You know there was no satisfying taste left in your mouth from that first round sweep. Uh, now, granted, there was some you know some side factors, you know injuries and that kind of stuff. Z didn't play, but still, you want to see this team get in and win a series to not only show fans and and you know the building that, hey, we're moving in the right direction, but you want to show yourselves as a team, we are in the stage of being competitive and we feel like we can be one of these top teams. And the only way you can do that is you got you, you at least got to win a series to find out what the next step feels like. I agree. I, I, I can't add more than that other than, look, last year 49 wins. You got to get to fifty. I think you got to get to fifty if you think you're going to be in a top six situation. Yeah. But like I said before, the margin of error is so small. Three, four more wins gets you a five or yeah. even possibly a four. So, um, but yeah, you got to win a series. Look, even though quote unquote the Pelicans have been playing teams two of the uh, three straight years, they were in the playoffs two yeah. of the three years. Yeah. So the next evolution is you got to. You got to advance. You got to advance and make sure you you're continuing to go in the right direction. But it's got to start at 50 wins. You got to in, in the Western Conference. You have to win 50 games. Along similar lines, to me, my definition of a successful season, and I'm not sure specifically how you define this in terms of wins or playoff advancement, but I want to see them ascend to like the next level of the Western Conference. And the comparison that I keep making is what the Mavericks and the Timberwolves did Pat, last season. I'm not saying that the Pelicans have to go to the Western Conference Finals to be successful season the way that those two teams did last year, but though in both of those cases it was a, it were it was teams that in Minnesota's case they kept making the playoffs but lose were losing in the first round. Dallas was not even in the play-in 2 years ago. Um to make the jump that they made, uh, that's what I want the Pelicans to do this year for it to be successful for people to say, "Okay, this isn't just a team that gets in the playoffs." And is a little bit competitive, but you know has to go through the play. And I want them to, to for people to, at the end of the season to say, okay, now this is a team that can move up another level to contention for the whole Western Conference. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you guys. I, I think um, that's along the lines of what you're saying, Jim. Getting to a team that is not just trying to be a play-in team or a playoff team. Along the lines of what JD said, it, it's time to start getting to that second round. Uh, for sure. All right. Uh, is what's the biggest reason for optimism? Is it because maybe Todd that they have a, a team that's kind of tasted a little bit of that success? You have a roster that pretty much everyone knows. You have been together. You've played together. They're as healthy as they can be going into the season. What's your biggest reason for optimism? Uh, <laughs> right now, uh, before we start the season, it's the fact that Dejounte Murray is going to be running the show in clutch time. That that to me, I mean, just think about what we just talked about. Uh, The clutch games last year that the Pelicans just were not able to close out was the difference between a play-in team and a top four. Mm -hmm. Bottom line. Yep. Bottom line. uh, There's no other way to look at it. So having Murray on the floor to close out those games and give you an opportunity uh, to win those clutch games, that could be the difference in two, three, four more wins. I think it's the talent that this team has makes me really optimistic. I mean... (laughs) I've mentioned this a few times during the offseason that there's various lists where they rank the top 100 players and the Pelicans have now have six players in that, which there's only a other couple, there's only maybe two or three other teams that can say that. And the other part of it too, not just the talent, but I think some of the talent is still improving when you look at where Trey Murphy is in his career, where you look at Herb Jones. I mean, it's not just that they have a bunch of good players, it's that there's still room for a lot of these guys to keep improving because they're so early in their career. And they have postseason experience. Yeah, yeah. I, my biggest reason for optimism is, is Z. He, I think, has a good understanding and grasp of what it is to be the man. And I think he's seen other superstars in the league. And I mean, not, not to say he took it for granted, but I mean, I think he when he got in shape last year, he was like an unstoppable force. And I believe, having seen him from afar this offseason, is like, he understand. I think it clicked for him. I think he understands. I only get one of these bodies. 
I got to take care of it, and I got to have it ready at all times. And he looks like a dude who, who middle of the summer, he looked like he was ready to step in and play an NBA game right then. And we have seen seasons where that was not necessarily the case. And it had to have been just unbelievably frustrating from last year to be on the bench while you know the Pelicans are playing Oklahoma City, and him knowing that you know if I was out there. We would have a chance to beat this team and just and he's got like you said he knows he's the man the pelicans have to have that guy on the court yep no doubt all right jim you are the most optimistic person ever so <laughs> what is the biggest concern for the pelicans this season i think with what seems to be an inclination tendency to go with small lineups i think rebounding is the thing that i'm going to be the most focused on that they, they're going to need to make sure they focus on that and have everyone on the court saying I'm going to try to grab every rebound. And the other thing is um, early season chemistry, that they didn't really get a great opportunity in preseason to get everything to come together. And I think if you look at the Pelicans' regular season schedule, the first 10, 12 games is on paper is the easiest portion of the year. I think they really need to take advantage of the first few weeks of the season because as we've seen the last couple of years, sometimes one or two games makes a huge difference. So can they get the early season – cohesiveness together can they figure out what the best lineups are and can they kind of just start from Wednesday night against the Bulls and that's something that I think is going to be key for them to start off seven and three eight and two in the first 10 games instead of you know what we've seen a lot of four and sixes and that kind of thing JD well I I guess I got to be the negative Nancy here even injuries I am until this team shows me they can stay healthy they can't stay healthy, so you got to you got to prove it. You got to do it, and I understand. NBA is a long season, man. Eighty-two games is a lot of work, but the primary guys on this team have been Brandon Ingram and Zion Williamson. And those guys have not been able to make it through healthy. And Z played a career high games last year, and he got hurt hurt at the end. So <laughs> availability, the best ability is availability. And those guys need to be available. We know that I think DJ Murray and I think CJ McCollum and, and you know Trey Murphy when he gets back, Knockwood and Herb Jones, those guys are you know gonna play a, a, a great amount of games. But, but the primary guys need to be available. And that's that's always gonna be the concern with me. Now Jim makes a good good point. You're on the size. You got to rebound, man. I mean, that's just, you know, you, you can get away with Some nights you'll probably be able to get away with and some nights it's going to be tough because it's just hard. You know, a, a good small guy is just not as good as a good big guy. That's just the way it is when it comes to that. Size does matter when you're talking about rebounding. But I think these guys, if they get it in the mindset, look, as Jim said, look, we all five got to go in there. We all five got to rebound. We, you know, this has got to be a team thing. I think they can they can make some hay there, but these guys got to be healthy. I mean, and the, they got to be healthy. I mean, God, I, when I saw that Trey, <laughs> when I saw that Trey Murphy was out, and I was thinking to myself, my goodness, really, not th- not this again. Mm-hmm. But it's one of those things where every time you hear a guy get injured, you're saying, well, here we go again. So hopefully, not here we go again. I want to see this team be healthy. All right, I'm going to go injuries one, rebounding two, and then I'm going to add three point shooting. That's oh mine. yeah, that's mine. And that's a good one. at home, well, especially. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I'm. This is where I'm coming from. We've heard for a month now about mm-hmm. 40 attempts, 40 attempts, 40 attempts. Are you going to do it, or are you going to revert back to the 31, 32, 33? Look, you know me. I, I take everything with a grain of salt. I saw them attempt to do it in the three preseason games. We had a 40-attempt game. We had a 38-attempt game and a 37-attempt game. The problem in the preseason was we were shooting 22%. Right. We were making Mm -hmm. them. Um, Mm -hmm. But are you going to stay the course, put them up? I mean, look, I listen to a lot of radio. I listen to NBA radio. And you know how many teams are saying exactly the same thing? Mm -hmm. Exactly the same thing. Phoenix was putting up. 50 threes wow. during the preseason. So they're trying to make a concerted effort to get more shots up from beyond the arc. That is the NBA right now. So can you get to the 40 mark? Can you stay around there? And even better, hopefully we have the percentage we did last year. Because if we're attempting 43s and we're making 39%, we're going to be in pretty good shape. Well, you that, That's it, the, the volume. 
the volume, the volume, the volume. Because you look at Boston. The volume matters. And then hopefully you get the accuracy. But the volume is going to mean something. Because, you know, we, we saw a lot of games last year where, you know, teams shoot 45 of them and you know, maybe make, you know, 13, 14, maybe 15. And you were like, mm. well, you know what? It's hard to overcome that when a team just bombards you with the volume and they make a decent amount of them. Because they, they overcome a lot of sins for a team. You know, when you make threes, you can stay in a game, or you can climb back in a game, or you can blow a game away. One of the, you know, one one of those scenarios can happen. And the numbers back it up. I mean, straight data: eleven games last year, the Pels had forty or more, nine and two. I mean, the numbers back it up. Now, Brandon Ingham, who I saw see some, knock wood, <laughs> Bi was shooting threes. Yeah. And I was like, you know what? Okay, I guess the message is getting through because he was a guy who was, was reluctant. To take that shot, and I, I, I don't know if it was one of those things because he shot it well, mm-hmm. but he was reluctant to take those shots. So I don't know if it was one of those things where he didn't want to bring down the deficiency or what it was. But it's like, my man, this is the way this game is now, and you have to do that. You've got to be able, to, especially when you got Z on the court. And he, look, Gus and Jim saw it during, I mean, this was day one mm-hmm. in training camp, day one. Uh, it was a concerted effort for Ingram. And look, if you need a mid-range, DeJounte Murray can make mid-range yeah. jumpers too. So yeah. it, it's it, – and, and, of course, we were just talking about Zion a little earlier. Uh, you'd, you'd love to see him pop pop three or four uh, during a game just to keep everybody honest. But can you keep that volume up? That is the key. Yeah, and I would love to see those threes go down at home for some reason. They just didn't a season ago. But to your point, that's why 20-point leads – they're not safe anymore. They're not safe anymore. All right, two final things, guys. Um, is there another Western Conference team that, you know, even if we're off or you're on the flight or whatever, Todd, that you kind of want to tune in and see? I, I love watching Anthony Edwards, but OKC sort of does good. Look, Victor Wimbanyama and what the Spurs could be doing. I, I, there's some other teams in the West I, that you I may ain't watching OKC anymore. No, I'm you're tired not, you're now. You're done with them? No, I'm done. <laughs> I am done with them. Uh, you know what I'm going to watch this year? I'm going to watch San Antonio, Houston. And Memphis. That's who I'm watching. Those are my answers, other than <laughs> Sam. I swear, I, man. I have to say, Memphis. Have I texted my... you or anything? No. 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 It is That's who I am. Yeah, I'm very color coded. Oh, it's a great mind thing alike. I mean, but JD, you're you know you're on another level. No, We're just kind of no, 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 no. You guys, I mean, you guys got who I, that is who I'm watching. You guys Those three got, teams. Now I will I will look a little bit more at at Memphis because you know John Morant's gonna come back and John Morant's gonna be John Morant and. You know, we saw John Morant for two games last year, and John Morant, Took even over. even not fully quote unquote John Morant, dominated those games. Mm-hmm. And it's like when this dude is back and he's right, mm-hmm. and he's working on his three point shot. Now suddenly, I mean, now Memphis did lose. You know, they don't have Stephen Adams anymore, so that helps from some standpoint. But man, I, I, that dude, you know, because I feel like I feel like there is a legit kind of rivalry there with Memphis. You know, like. You know, there's not a lot of teams in the NBA that I dislike, but I kind of don't like Memphis. I can't say the same. Thing. <laughs> yeah. I kind of, I, I kind of don't like. I kind of don't like Memphis, and I, and I well, think you shouldn't, John. You shouldn't. Because <laughs> I mean, I can respect them, but I just, I, I mean, this general, I don't necessarily. I just don't. There's something about them. You know, they're a, a chirpy crew, and I just don't like them. And so, but having said that. I can't keep my eyes off them because yep. when they're playing, they're they play an exciting brand of basketball. The reason that I had Houston and Memphis, I guess I'll start with Memphis. To me, Memphis has a chance to make the biggest impact on the West overall because you take a team that two years ago and three years ago they were two seed. Last year they didn't even make the play in with all the injuries they had. If they go back to being what they were two years ago, you're talking there's another team in the mix Mm -hmm. for contention at the top of the West. And then Houston kind of on the other end of the spectrum in some ways because they were really bad for three, four years in a row, and then last year they returned to being – uh, they were 41, team. yeah, they right, were 41 and 41. So, I mean, I mean <laughs> if you add them back into the mix as far as teams that are legit top eight contenders, it, it makes it even more of a of a fight for getting into the playoffs or getting into the play-in tournament. So, and, I mean, the Spurs, too, you could put in that category as well. I think the Rockets are a little further ahead of where the Spurs are. I mean, obviously the Spurs won – like 22 games last year, so they got they have a long ways to go. They have much further to go than Houston, but 
Um, Memphis can change the whole dynamic of the West race if they return to what they were. And Houston can just add another team to this pileup of of squads that makes it so that there's no easy nights in the West. Well, and you go to then if those teams are as decent as we think they're going to be, then you're talking about maybe Oklahoma City and Minnesota and Dallas. Well, they're not going to roll into San Antonio and win four games against right. them this year. So everybody mm-hmm. cannibalizes each other, yeah. which makes it, I mean... Every night, guys. It's, Jeez, it's a fight, man. man. It's a, you know, what, I like all. The, I like to categorize it as a knife fight. I mean, you got to go in there and you got to, you know, this is this is close combat. This is, you know, this is scrapping to the end, and, it, and there there won't be a lot of games where you can just be flat. Yeah, I understand. Again, eighty-two games, you're gonna have some of those. You know, back to backs, you're gonna have some of those, but you can't afford to have a lot of them. I just feel bad. We've been doing almost 30 minutes, and it's all pointless because we never talked about the Lakers. They will be the number one pick overall, right? Uh, number one seed based off I, of what Bronny yeah. is doing. And <laughs> I'll watch it for the train wreck. That's that's <laughs> look in all honesty, you know, like those two teams, right? We're battling towards the end for nine and ten for most of that season. Golden State being the other one, we're going to face Golden wow. State in, in the first week here. Yeah. So <laughs> what? What do you view the Warriors? I, I honestly don't know. I, I know Steph Curry, what he did in the Olympics was one of the most magical things I've ever seen live take place in that gold medal game. But where are they this uh, season? That's a great question. Uh, I mean, look, as long as Steph's out there, they're going to have a chance, especially in their own building. And, and Draymond, um, you know, Kaminga's really, really good on the inside, but they're just... I, I don't know. They just don't have. I mean, look, losing Clay may or may not hurt, but how much of an impact was he uh, in the last season? So, um, I I don't know if I, I've ever seen. We're going to find out very quickly, though. Next week, have we ever seen a West where? I mean, you no, start, we didn't even talk about Golden State or the right, Lakers. But teams like them, where I see some people saying, "Man, if everything goes right, they could be like a four seed." And if everything goes wrong, they're going to be scratching and clawing to get into the play-in. I mean, there's a bunch of teams that you could put in that category. I don't know if we've ever seen that well, before. Well, Brandon Pajemski's the X Factor. I mean, they, they ranked him ahead of Herb Jones. So, I mean, look. <laughs> True. Good point. But yeah, when really good point. When you're in that, everything needs to go right for X, Y, Z to happen. That's hot. <laughs> yeah. Because everything ain't going to go yeah. right. It just mm-hmm. didn't. And, and you know, I, I look, I'm looking at a team across the parking lot where you say, man, man if, if these – Five, six, seven, eight things go good right. Point. This can be a good team. And now all five, six, seven, eight of those things have gone wrong, and they've lost five games in a row. So, <laughs> so you're talking about that with an NBA team. Things rarely go exactly how you're playing them out, especially over the course of a long season. And like you said, I mean, we're thinking, we're saying, who we're going to blah 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 blah. All these teams are playing 82 games, and none of mm-hmm. them are going to have a fully healthy roster for 82 games. Yeah. So. It's not only on the injury side, but the timing of those injuries as well. Yeah, and when those three balls go down, because that's kind of, I think, what this season is going to be based on one way, shape, or form. All right, final topic, guys. Hot takes. What is your look at you? Just you just perked up when I said that. Go ahead, Jim. Gus, we, I sent out a message saying we're not doing the hot takes. We're not doing the so hot we takes. I have to revisit this. I later want a hot take. In the hot take. No hot you must take. have missed the no memo. hot takes. No, so you we didn't, we didn't come hot with hot take. takes. We'll come back. Maybe we'll come back in a, a couple of weeks with a hot take. I, I don't know. Maybe one hot take here. Um, all right, as we round up, though, look, the season starts, of course, obviously on Wednesday against the Bulls. What is the biggest thing that you want to look forward towards this game? Come out hard. I mean, come out ready to go. Um, this is a really important game. Um, not just because it's the first game, but we've been talking about it. Got to get to a quick start. You've got to take care of business at home. If the Pels would have played well at home last year, again, if, coulda, woulda, shoulda, um, it, it, it's crazy that you set the record for franchise wins on the road and couldn't get it done at home. Yeah. Um, especially against Eastern Conference teams, which is a very – weird thing for me um but this is look bulls got a lot of talent too and by the way lonzo ball is going to make his first appearance in two years and you don't think he's not motivated to play well going back into the smoothie king center uh think again so bulls got a lot of talent uh they were one of three teams thank you jim that the pelicans did not beat last year uh including in chicago and colby white 
basically had his coming out party and made seven threes. So um, did he ever make seven threes again? No. Okay, it's funny no, how that works. No, okay. I was there to see it. <laughs> it was. Uh, but anyway, look, just come out hard and, and get a win at home. I'm with Greg. Just, w- just win and establish beating at home the teams you're supposed to. I know the Bills got, Bulls got talent. Everybody in the NBA does. But this is a team that you should have an advantage on. Beat them at home. Take care of home. Because you, when you're talking about a franchise record for wins on the road, that says something about a team. No doubt. That says something really good about a team. Now, you got to make folks dread coming to your place. I agree, Jay. And I, I, you know, I hope this is the season for that. But I want folks to come into this place like, you know what? Whew, this is going to be a fight. We, we're not going to, you know, this is not something we're just going to mark down on the calendar and say we got one. You got you to gotta come in here, and I, I want folks to dread coming here to play the Pelicans. I would love to see the Pelicans play an amazing first game and win by 15, 20 points, but honestly, just winning by one will be good enough for me. Mm-hmm. I mean, one thing, too, if you obviously if you look at the schedule, they don't have another home game after this for nine days. No, so we're going for a week. You got you to gotta get these wins, and... I've been pleading and begging for this for several years now, but I just want to see a season where after the first 10 games or by Thanksgiving, they're in really good position instead of saying like, okay, we're behind a little bit now. We got to make this up. So um, it's crucial, like I said earlier, that they start off at a part of the season where they're playing teams that did not play well last year that they can pick up a bunch of wins. All right, you mentioned 7-3. and three. Guys, final thing, we'll wrap up here. I've never seen this, right? First 10 games, 5 away, 5 home. It's an even Stevens thing. There's 5 on the road, there's 5 at home. I- I'm with you. You have to be above 500, I think, in those first 10, and then you're going to start playing some interesting teams. J.D., he went 7-3, and three, I think, right? Right, Jim? You said 7-3? Yeah, and three? I think I, I, think I well, said 7-3. What seven do you want to see this team in the first 10? I'm going to I'm going to stay with Jim cuz I hate making predictions on records. Sure. So I'm going to stay with Jim and go 7 to 3 too. Um bank up something because hey, at some point it's going to start raining. <laughs> so you need to have mm-hmm. something to lean on when the when the hard times come and you go through one of those little downspouts where things aren't going well and you might lose 3 out of 5, 4 out of 5. You need to have something to be able to to lean back on. Uh, I'll go with that too. Um you know, those first 5 games it's interesting cuz you got the home game against the Bulls and then you got two baseball series. You're going to Portland and San Francisco. But that is not, you know, I'm not disrespecting those teams, but it's not daunting. It's not it's not like going into into Dallas and Oklahoma City for two two for one. So you have an opportunity, especially in those first five games, to get well over 500. And then as you come back home for that four-game homestand, I believe it is, then just to kind of stay the course. So I think the first five games are more important than the next four are. And you, and you, know, you want to see them start well, too, because the city right now yeah. is ripe mm-hmm. for this team. Mm-hmm. To win and support it, ripe, because oh, I mean we know how New Orleans is. You got you got to win some, especially the NBA team. You got to win to to make people come out early. And I think there's an opportunity to get them out early and to really get them involved because they, they, this is a team that I think folks want to like. They want to embrace. When it, two seasons ago, where the Pell started eleven straight sellouts, member. Oh yeah, two yeah. Seasons ago. No, after, that, that after was an the amazing Phoenix. feeling, yeah. and, and no, that was, helped the team get the first place in yeah, the Western Cor- Conference. No, no doubt about it. Yeah. And you know, just to even go further, now you're going to have more eyes on you. Yeah. With with, yeah. with the games being, you know, local TV, yeah. Fox Eight, and the mm-hmm. Gulf Coast Sports and Entertainment Network. Yeah, so Wednesday's key, man. No, and and. Um, you know, there are going to be a lot of late nights in the next in the next week, week and a half, because we're going to be playing on the West Coast with a Sunday afternoon game mixed in there. So you got an opportunity to come back on that on the first real homestand to get some people in the building. Yes, sir. I mean, they have to take advantage of it. But I mean, when I first saw the schedule, I was wondering if I, someone gave me the wrong schedule because the way that the league, it feels like the Pelicans usually get like three games against Boston in the first two right. games. <laughs> it seemed like we, they, would, they would play goal, in the prime of Golden State. We're mm-hmm. talking Durant, Curry, Clay all together, all at their the peak of their powers. It felt like the league would always be like, yeah, you can play the Warriors three times between you know the end of October and Thanksgiving. So it's definitely a little bit of a change, but like I said, they're going to have to capitalize on it and, and pick up some early wins. Yep. No doubt. Jim Eikenhofer, 
John the Shades with Todd Raffini. Thank you, fellas. Uh, let's get going tomorrow. The NBA season starts. And then on Wednesday, everybody else gets going. Opening night tomorrow, then opening night for the Pels on Wednesday. Looking forward to a fun season. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Our thanks to John DeShazer and Todd Graffinini for that radio roundtable. Again, we could have done that for another hour and a half here. Because honestly, Jim, we could be talking about every team in the NBA and their reasons for optimism and concern and stuff like that. And I think it is going to be fun watching. If you're a fan of the league, you're going to have fun. And I know there are a lot of fans of our next guest. That's Mr. Jose Alvarado, who again... I know we haven't played a regular season game, but you'll hear it in the interview that we had with him after practice. There's something different about him going into the season in there. I can feel it. I thought we saw in training camp that he was more aggressive, that he's a little bit more confident offensively, maybe more able to look for his own shot. But, I mean, he he'll, he says it in the interview, too. He knows that his role isn't going to be, I need to go out and score 18 points a game off the bench. But... The fact that he can do that, I think, and that he has more aggressiveness in his game, I think can only help as far as the balance between, okay, I'm going to go out here and set people up and now I'm going to score. Early in his career, even though we saw the shirts that said, yes, I can shoot, I think teams definitely would go (laughs) under picks against him and and, and give him that jumper. But I think he's going to try to make teams pay for that strategy more now. Yeah. Uh, The other important element of it is I was telling Todd during – training camp is he this team's second best ball handler and look that's an area of growth for this team late game situations the guys just talked about it what the Jean Murray can bring but he's gonna have to sit down and take a rest and when they hand the ball over to another guy to run the offense we even saw it in Nashville there were times they put Zion with him they were doing pick and roll so I if the if there isn't a ball handling decision making drop off mm-hmm. That's the size of the Grand Canyon when your starting point guard goes out. I sure. think that helps this team as well. Yeah, and I think he's he's still the most pass-first traditional pure point guard that they have on the roster. DeJounte can play that way, and he definitely seems enthusiastic about changing his game to fit the fact that there's so much talent on the floor. But Jose, I mean, sometimes we saw this last year, too, in particular, when they didn't have a quote-unquote, you know, full-fledged point guard in the starting lineup there were games where jose would come in and the offense just had a lot a lot better flow because he always has his head up he's always looking for guys and sometimes that's that benefits the offense a ton when you have a point guard who is like if i take two shots tonight i'm good as long as everybody else is getting the ball in the right spots all right here's our conversation with jose alvarado pleasure to welcome mr jose alvarado to the pelicans podcast sir how are you how you doing doing? i'm good and yourself doing well i'm sure he's excited to get the regular season going here i know one thing we want to get into obviously man it's been fun since i last saw you was media day and uh i know you had a little you had a little bit of business before then signing a new contract man what's that been like man it's been great i mean it's just uh, a weight on my shoulder but also just be um just looking forward for the straight basketball now you know not a lot of the outside a lot of outside noise you know that's done and over with so for me and then just to just focus on on the team and you know just playing basketball so it was a great great deal for me we spoke with Trey Jamison a little bit earlier about his journey and stuff like that man when you sit there and just think of the journey to get to that point to do that it's what's the first thing that kind of maybe stands out in your mind I'm blessed you know this journey it's if you go back to it man like if you ask me would I be in the project predicting me I mean I'm now hell no so um it's just a, a great feeling and um just show how much I love this game and care and work so hard and I just had the great support around me though you know with the Pelicans organization believing me from the jump and you know they saw something that you know I didn't see in myself at first and they kept pushing me to be a better version of myself and I came in and wanted to be a better version too so it all worked out. (laughs) What's been the reaction that you've gotten from like your family and friends after that news of the contract extension? Um, uh, They cry they, you know, it's the best thing to them, you know, uh, where I come from, um, it just never happens financially, it never happens, uh, you know, you pull my whole family together, we were nowhere near, but, you know, the financial part, so that's a blessing in that, and, and you know, everybody just want to see, the people that love me want to see me win, and, um, and I'm doing that, and uh, I'm just trying to do it for the next generation that's, you know, that's in my neighborhood, or not in my neighborhood, just small people that, people that say they can't make it, and just keep pushing. I saw in one of your interviews that you did on Media Day, I think it might have even been for the Squad documentary, you talked about how 
um, much gratitude, you, how happy you've been to see the way that your parents have reacted to maybe not just the contract extension, but just the whole journey that you've had so far. Can you kind of speak on that a little bit more? Uh, my, mom, my family, yeah, man, um, the money part is cool, you know, but they don't, like, they, they, they're more happy that their son is doing what he's been trying to do his whole life, you know, just working hard. And, you know, my parents always tell you that they, they knew I was special, you know, as all parents would say to their kid. But um, they really believe that. They kept on telling me since I was like 11 to 10 years old that I remember that you're special, that, you know, you're going to be special and just keep pushing. And, you know, um, I'm pretty sure if I, you know, you ask them that if they seen this coming, they say, yeah, but they lying, you know, but they just happy for me and they, they know the journey that we've been part of. And also just giving back to them, you know, um, they've been through a lot. They sacrificed a lot for me when I was little, you know, their life as when I got kids, you know, time and your time is important and you want to do other stuff with other friends, but then, especially being a young parent, you got to stay there for your kids and stuff like that. So they did a lot, you know, sacrifice, and I, I'm happy for them. We saw you, I mean, everybody saw you, what you did in the Olympics and what you did for Puerto Rico. And then it seemed like a lot of people thought that you had a really good training camp, that you had an excellent training camp for um, in Nashville, obviously. Um, what do you think, do you think you'll be like a different player now? Do you think there's stuff from the off season that you'll carry over, that your approach is different or just more confidence, more, more, more something with basketball i mean yeah i mean getting i'm on getting more confidence every day um getting better every day you know obviously the olympics was a great experience for me because it was a different role for me you know uh i showed that case that i could you know play that but the pelicans don't need that right now you know that that puerto rican jose and i understand that and it's it's a great thing that just to have in my back pocket uh we got enough offensive power i just gotta focus on you know, this energy that I got to bring every day and um, defensively, you know, on shots is going to go on, on and off for me. But most likely, like, I just got to focus on the little things, especially with the Pelicans. And that's what my focus is on now. You know, the uh, Olympics and Puerto Rico was a blessing. But now it's time to change, you know, change the page and, you know, focus on trying to, you know, win as much games here. It's interesting you say that because we're sitting in Nashville watching some of those practices and, Two words kept popping in my head watching you guys practice specifically you, confidence and also presence. And I'm talking to Antonio Daniels like that. I just feel there's a presence when you're on there. And you with that second union competing against them, you wanted to, that, that felt like a real honest-to-goodness game. You wanted to win as much as about that. Is that kind of along the lines of what he's saying when you have that confidence and you're just focusing about basketball? Now it's just about you going to do that. But I, I feel like there's a presence about you this year that maybe you didn't have last year. No, I, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I mean, I just feel like, you know, uh, my voice is getting bigger in here. You know, they understand uh, how much I work, and um, they trust me. These guys, you know, show a lot of respect for me, and, they know I'm going to push them to the best of their ability. So they just, you know, they were with me the whole time. And, you know, like you said, the second group versus the first group, you know, I get to be a little bit, you know, more talking <laughs> talking crap to the uh, to the other team. I just want that starting five to know how special they could be and how special, you know, they, they need to be to us to go to the finish line. And, you know, so I got to push them to the next level. And, you know, that's be about me competing, my present, and, you know, just going out there being myself. I wanted to ask you about DeJounte Murray as far as, you know, your relationship with him. I heard him do an interview where he talked about how in the short amount of time that he's gotten to know you, he's gotten a good understanding of just your approach to the game, and he just respects that a ton as far as I think he said, like, you have a heart of a lion on the court. And also just, just being a father as well. Um, what's it been like, I guess, so far in this early stage getting to know DeJounte? I mean, he's a, a, true, a true leader, um, a great person. And, you know, just overall that, you know, the true leaders and great person go very well together. You know, he's, he's willing to teach you, but he's also willing to learn and listen to you and understand where you're coming from and also just put a p different picture in your head to understand what he's looking at. So he's just a great, uh, great, great teammate, obviously, but uh, just a great leader. You know, um, he's going to be a great leader for us. You mentioned earlier how, like, you even had some doubts about whether you were going to be in the NBA, like, long term and that kind of thing. And um, he mentioned uh, Antonio Daniels earlier. Um, what what kind of role is, did Antonio have for you, like, early in your career? It seemed like I remember him saying that there was times when he kind of had to assure you, like, hey, man, you, you belong here. You need to know that, you, that you, you're you an NBA player and that kind of thing. Oh, man, AD, he helped me a lot. You know, I talked to AD a lot, you know, over the phones and just texting, just hearing him out. You know, obviously his story and my story is way different, but it was guys that care about this so much. And AD been around the greats. Uh, he played with the greats, been around them, you know, saw the greats. So uh, for him to even give me that compliment was a, a, 
a confident boost for me and just understand my time is going to be there. And then when it does, it's going to take advantage of it. And just hearing a person that with that voice that knows so much history about this game saying that I'm, I'm an NBA player, it just did a lot for me, and I appreciate him so much. Got to ask you about your good friend, Brandon Ingram. Um, he, uh, I mentioned how you had a great training camp. It seemed like he had a exceptional training camp as well. And then in the preseason game against Houston, he looked like he was like in midseason form already. What do you think about what you've seen from him over the last few weeks since training camp started? Oh, man, amazing. I asked him one thing to be funny, and I just I knew he was really locked in, and I think it's going to be a very good season for him. I asked him, what are we doing for All-Star break? He said, I'm going to be in the All-Star game. So there goes that, that answer for you and, you know, the playing style he's coming with, the confidence he's coming with, the headspace he's coming with. So, you know, um, I'm happy for him, and I can't wait for him to lead us. Last thing for me, um, there's been a – the whole Grand Theft Alvarado thing has, has been a huge deal that has – grown every year in popularity um what do you think has been is there one thing that you can point to that's been the most enjoyable part about just that specific thing like there was a somebody made like a video game thing where you like climbed over the scorers table and there was one where you like dressed as a referee and stole the ball yeah, the but mascot I mean, is pretty cool they had me at a mascot that's, i didn't see that one uh, yeah. they had you in a mascot yeah. uniform yeah a costume, I mean. yeah yeah it's pretty cool that's perry at perry yeah that was, that was perry gotcha. yeah so, um, I mean, that, that journey is amazing. I mean, just so, you know, have a, you know, an icon thing in the league, you know, just a, a, more, a, a different swag to it, you know, just to have, and when they when somebody does it, oh, that's the GTA. So, you know, just to have that as a blessing and, you know, continue doing it. Man, I wish it would die down a little bit so I could get more steals, but, you know, everybody's, you know, looking for it. <laughs> okay, so it's hard to get it out, but I, I, it's a blessing just to be in that in that conversation. I asked you about it maybe about a year or so, maybe a little bit more than a year ago. Have you do you continue to hear more stories about um, like high school kids, middle school kids doing that and implementing that into their game? Yeah, yeah. I mean, some coaches yell at me because they they don't want the kids to do that, and some coaches happy about it. You know, it just there's a love hate relationship there for sure because you know it's definitely different from a ba- a, a, a basketball play. You know, it's just something that you got to feel, you got to understand, and. You know, um, I'm happy just to be in conversations. Like I said, it's just a great feeling. All right, Mr. Jose Alvarado, thank you for your time, man. Appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate y'all. Thank you, man. All right, thanks for Jose Alvarado for joining us and giving us a little bit of time. It's great to kind of hear his journey and getting that contract, what it means for him and his family. But you can, you can just see it. It's, it's, and he said it. It's about basketball. He's confident because of it. He doesn't have to worry about it. And I think his game's getting better more and more that he gets to, you know, believe and feel that he is a legit NBA player. And I love that you brought up that relationship with him and Brandon Ingram, too. I'm excited for what the Pelicans bench can do. I mean, I think obviously they're not going to have Trey Murphy at the beginning of the season, but we saw them do serious damage last year where they were the second best bench in the league. And Jose, I think, is going to take another step this year in his his um, development, his progression of being somebody that's other teams are concerned about when he comes in off the bench. So um, really excited to see what that group can do. And we don't even know really for sure yet what that group, who specifically is going to be in that group. But Jordan Hawkins <laughs> is another guy yeah. who I'm really looking forward to watching play this season. Yeah, looking forward to that here as well. And since it is the start of the regular season, it means on Mondays you like to do what? I like to have a Pelicans player to watch. I also like to have a player of the week. However, that will obviously not start until next week because they haven't played any regular season games. But the player to watch for me this week, and obviously they play three games in what the NBA defines as the week from Monday through Sunday, only against two different opponents. I'm going with DeJounte Murray because I think it, his, it's important, his matchups against Josh Giddy and Lonzo Ball with the Bulls on Wednesday. And then Portland has Scoot Henderson, Anthony Simons, guys like that in their backcourt. I'm curious to see, I mean, not just specifically because of the Bulls and Trailblazers, but DeJounte Murray's first week, official week as a Pelican during the regular season to see what kind of impact he can he can make. So that's my Pelicans player to the watch, to watch for week one. It's a good one. I, I can't wait to watch him here either as well. So uh, Pels will be at home on Wednesday night. We'll be back with you on Wednesday to get you ready for that game. We'll have some very special guests coming into that podcast here as well. As always, appreciate you for tuning us in on the New Orleans Pelicans podcast. Thanks for listening to the New Orleans Pelicans podcast. Join us three times per week on Pelicans.com, the Pelicans mobile app, the iHeartRadio app, or where you get your podcast. 
And be sure to give Jim and Gus a follow on X at Jim underscore Eichenhofer and GCAT underscore 17. We'll see you next time right here on the New Orleans Pelicans podcast.